Te nā koutou kei ngā kaitiaki i ngā takuahi i runga i o tātou marae maha huri noa, nau mai hoki mai anō kia tapatahi. Ki konei anō tātou wete wete ai i ngā take nui o te ao Māori. Kā tira whakatau mai rā. Welcome to the program and thanks for joining us. Please let us know if you're watching and if you have a question or comment on any of today's issues. Well, coming up on today's program, we catch up again with Ra Beasley, owner-operator of Ecobol. What have they had to do to reopen for business in Alert Level 3? Rahui Papa joins us to discuss the rahui that has been placed over the Waikato and Waipa rivers. We speak with a social services provider in Wellington to understand the work being done to support Fano, and we look at the results of a survey that focuses on the highs and lows of learning at home. Dad and home cook Jason Tiako talks to us about how his cooking skills have taken social media by storm. And kaitaia couple Connie and Tony Hessen join us with a special waiata. Oh, we're still locked down on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday because we're so very good. We will stay here on Thursday and Friday and Saturday because we know we should. But first, here's what you need to know in 30 seconds. Well, it's day two and alert level three. The new national total of confirmed and probable cases of COVID-19 is 1,472. There are two new confirmed cases, one new probable case and no further deaths. There are nine people in hospital with the coronavirus with one in intensive care. Of the total number of cases, 132 are Māori and 73 are Pacifica. The Ministry of Health has changed the way it reports these numbers, so we've had to convert the percentages into real numbers for you. Well, it's day two at Alert Level 3, and while some workplaces, retail and restaurants have reopened for business, others will open today or over the next few days. Ra Beasley owns and operates Eka Bowl in Auckland, who had to move quickly to keep on top of business during the lockdown. He closed the three Ikabol businesses located across Auckland. But now Ra is ready to reopen Ikabol with meals being ordered and paid for online. Ra is with me now. Tēnā koe, Ra. Thank you for joining us. Good, thanks for having me. It's great um, that you could join us again. We've been following you on this journey um, and it must... Well, it's been like a roller coaster ride for you, and it's still going. Um, is that how you would describe it? Uh, yeah, I think we're starting to head into the, the, the tricky parts. Um, we've had the last four or five weeks to really um, just meditate and think about stuff. But um, I think now the hardest thing is we have to implement those, those uh, plans and actions. And I think the hardest thing that's going to be, uh, uh, the case is going to be that the fact that... Um, we will now uh, only have a short lifetime kind of to, to get these op plans and options and action uh, until we run out of the money and funds and the resources that we need to keep going. Yeah, it's really um, kind of serious situation now. Well, tell us about some of these options that you've had to implement uh, ready to reopen your businesses tomorrow. Um, so for, we've had to um, completely overhaul how we operate in terms of our store. So... Obviously, all the safe practices now have to be implemented and um, not being able to have our customer locally is, is really hard. The fact that they have to order online and we have to kind of present our food not in person but, but over digital in the digital space, um, it's going to be quite challenging. And for us in particular, we're down here at the Open Fish Market site where it's our first site to launch. Um, a lot of our customers are office workers and there's, there's no office buildings that are closed, so... Um, we're just really, it's, it's going to be tough navigating this space. What about your staff? Are they all returning to work when you open? Yeah, so um, we're fortunate enough to, to, be, to have had hold on to all our staff. So all 16 of our staff, um, we just have to pop them in and out. Uh, everyone will be getting paid more than the hours that they're working, but um, as long as everyone gets to get to go in the store and we can have a reason to hold everyone, and that's our main goal. Have you had any challenges working with your supply chain? Yeah, so a massive thing for us is we always had great relationships with our supply chain. Um, you know, we, we're, still, we're still a small business and we were always a small business. And we came into this, this industry not knowing anything, so um, we had to really rely on building a personal relationship with our suppliers. Um, they really liked our story and, and um, we've got some investment going both ways with them, so... 
yeah, so some of our suppliers are friends of mine, so um, I feel feel for them as well. They've, they've been just as um, impacted as us, so we just have to really um, be in the boat, same boat together and keep going. So you'll be back open for business uh, from tomorrow. Uh, for those that are wanting to order kai from you, what do they have to do? Um, so we have a button on our website. So pretty much how we're going to do it is you go onto our website, you place the order. It's very simple. So we've laid it out so you can customise your, your, your meal. You can have less carbs, more carbs. Um, you can have the fish, you can have chicken, all these kind of things. Um, we've made it really easy so you can do that and then... Uh, if you want to come and pick up, you simply park in the car park and call us when you're here. We'll bring your food. We'll either put it in your boot. So you pop your boot, we'll put it in there and there's no contact there, or we'll put it in the back seat of your car. Um, otherwise, we have a station that you can pick up from as well. So it's all pick up? There's no delivery option on offer at this stage? Uh, we have. So obviously, um, as a lot of people now know, a lot of the partnerships with delivery, third-party delivery, um, they take quite a fair percentage, so it's not very viable. So we, we do have still have those channels, but we prefer for people to pick up. Um, for those who live in within a 5K radius of our store here in Winyard Quarter, Auckland Fish Market, uh, we do offer a partnership with Flamingo, so they deliver your food um, on an e-scooter. So we do have that option as well. What about those that live outside the 5K radius? Uh, for example, someone... Uh, out here in East Tamaki, are they still able to place an order and is there a delivery option there? There isn't at the moment, um, just because internally we don't think it's viable enough. Um, and the other thing that we don't want to do is um, overpromise. So to be able to get your food to you, our food is fresh and it's meant to be consumed, um, you know, on, on the spot kind of thing. And we do understand that, that asking people to travel so far is, is a, a big problem. So... Um, that's the biggest problem that we see for the future of our business is the fact that all our stores have been located in areas which prior to COVID was a smart, you know, high, high foot traffic um, area. So I think now going forward, um, we're looking at reaching out to cafes who might not be operating and saying, hey, can we jump in the same space? You guys have all the seating room that you don't use. We don't know how long this level three and level two and, and these restrictions are going to be. How about you, you know, we, we do this together and we jump in that same same boat. Um, so we're exploring that and seeing how we can get closer to our, to our people. You've mentioned uh, the tough times ahead and the challenges that you've already faced but still continue to face. Do you have a short-term plan in place to assess the future viability of your business? Uh, yeah, so... So now that the, the kind of, uh, what is it, stop, stop clock or, or the time is going, we, um, we have a realistic and it is a little bit bleak um, future that we're looking at. So we have roughly uh, seven weeks until we completely run out of resources to keep going. And um, I don't say this to try and um, guilt or anything like that, but it's just the realistic nature of, of running a business. Um, so we have seven weeks to, to make something happen. But after four weeks is when we won't have the resources to actually pivot or move. So for me, um, as an owner, and, and, and I have responsibilities both financially and to look after my staff and stuff like that and the, and the future well-being of them, um, we, have to, we have three options, really. It's one, we liquidate right now and we save, save the heartache because there is a high chance that things aren't going to go back to normal. Um, number two is the fact that we, we just hope and... We sit with what we've got and the stores we have and, and the resources we have, and we hope that there's a quick turnaround um, or three. Uh, we risk and we invest the money that we have for the potential that this new pivot and trying to get in proximity of, of our customers is the is like not the safest option, but it's the only option. So uh, we're leaning more towards this this new pivot, and um, it could bring, make us or break us. But um, yeah, we're just in, in it for the ride. Ra, we thank you again for joining us uh, this morning and our thoughts are with you. Uh, kia kaha, kia koutou, and uh, we, wishing, we, we wish you much success as you uh, reopen uh, your business tomorrow. Awesome, thank you. Ra Beasley there, the owner-operator of Ika Bowl here in Auckland.
And later in the program, we'll speak to Jason Tiako and see what he's been cooking up during lockdown in Kirikiriroa. Well, staying in Kirikiriroa, a rāhui has been placed over the Waikato and Waipa rivers, prohibiting food gathering and all recreational activities on the waterways of the Waikato region. The rāhui, a cultural and spiritual pro prohibition, was announced by King Tuheitia Pōtatau Te Whero Whero Te Tuawhitu and came into effect on Monday of this week. The rāhui was declared in response to the coronavirus crisis and is aimed at protecting the rivers. With me today is Kingi Tanga spokesperson Rāhui Papa to discuss the reasons and implications of the ban. Te nā koe rāhui. Te nā koe te tuakana Shane. Ngā mihi ki a koe, what are the reasons for the rāhui to be placed now as we move into Alert Level 3? So when we drop down from Alert Level 4 uh, to Alert Level 3, uh, there were uh, some uh, relaxing, I suppose, of the uh, restrictions uh, in the confinement. That was an announcement from the government. The EBC see it a little bit differently. We see uh, that the, uh, and especially the King sees, that we should remain at the highest level of tupatotanga uh, as it comes to uh, COVID. That means that the wairua of the people and the wairua of the awa are synonymous with each other, and they need time uh, to rejuvenate and to regenerate the spirit as well. When we talk about hepiko hetanifa, hepiko hetanifa, we're talking about the Modi and the wairua of the river. Uh, and it's, it's really a call to action for all of our people to just stay home uh, and stay safe, because the safety of the spirit of the people lends itself to the safety of the wairua of the other. Rahui, you've said that for many of us, rivers and waterways are a source of spiritual uplifting. Why is the Rahui essential for the health of, of the waterways? So a Rahui uh, puts uh, some restrictions. It's not, it's not meant to be a big stick uh, to uh, encourage uh, punishments and te uh, mene uh, it's, it's, i It's about uh, really uh, providing uh, some guidance and some leadership because in our view, uh, Waikato uh, and our, our waterways are tupuna, uh, you know, and, uh, and it's those types of uh, situations, and especially in the times where the people are, uh, are feeling uh, not so toe, uh, that, uh, that the waterways also have, a, uh, have a, an effect. So it's about looking after the teiao, it's about looking after the tangata. You talk about not using a stick to enforce the rahui, but how will it be policed and monitored? So it's going to be uh, by uh, it's going to be a process of um, education, really, uh, and uh, so we're going to ask some of our Fano just to uh, just to uh, be um, close to their homes, those um, those marae in those areas that are close to their homes, uh, to have a chat with people uh, in and ask them to consider, uh, to seriously consider, the staying in their bubble. Uh, because that's the way, uh, the highest uh, that we can bring to bear to stop the spread of this COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic coming in, into our communities. Uh, to date, uh, we're not sure that there has been any fatalities for Māori, and we want to keep it that way. So we want to re remain uh, like that. So it's going to be by a quarter or a sit-down and a discussion, uh, and it's going to be a process of education. How long will the rahui be in effect? Yeah, we're not sure, uh, Shane. Uh, so uh, we, uh, after the 11th of May, when the uh, uh, government announces their plans, we will have a reconsideration. Uh, it may uh, decrease from there, um, uh, similar to some of the uh, uh, roadblocks that are happening around the country. Uh, there are other... Uh, rahui in place on waterways across uh, various iwi and across the country. And, and so uh, that's something that will have to be taken into consideration. Kingi Tuheitia has said the waterways need to rejuvenate and remain a source of inspiration for our collective wairua. What state has the health of the waterways been up to at uh, this point? Well, uh, that's why it was important for the Waikato River settlement uh, to be uh, brought on board. Uh, because the, the the river, since uh, you, you know time immemorial, has been uh, degraded year upon year, generation upon generation, uh, and so. And, but we've seen uh, that without the sort of massive human contact, 
there has been some gains that have been happening uh, in the health uh, of the waterways. And so uh, we want to uh, ab absolutely change the dial of normality in New Zealand uh, so that we look after the teiau and we look after the tangata just that, uh, just that uh, a little wee bit more. Tēnā koe, Rāhui. And finally, uh, because I know you've been heavily involved in the iwi COVID-19 response, how do you think that's going? And uh, more importantly, how are the people fearing? Yeah, so uh, the people are, are, are fearful, uh, actually. Uh, and the, um, I think that the iwi response is a must in New Zealand. And I'm glad that there's been some acknowledgements about uh, iwi interventions across the country. Uh, Look, it's never going to be uh, an easy road uh, road to hoe. Uh, it's always going to be difficult. Uh, but uh, we have in the collectivity of working together with uh, civil defence and DHBs and governmental agencies is probably stronger than it's ever been. And so we don't want that. We don't need a pandemic to work with ourselves in our country, provided that we are at the table and providing uh, their viewpoint. Kei te tuakana tēnā roa atu ki a koe, kua paura te wā ki a tāua, engari e mihi ana ki a koe. Ngā mihi chen, kia ora mai. Rāhui papa there. Keeping Wellington's most vulnerable safe and up to date with the information coming out of the government's COVID-19 response are some of the issues keeping Ngāti Kahunganu Whānau services busy. Now that we are at Alert 3, the service provider is working to move Fano from emergency housing into transitional housing. Joining us now is Ali hamlin painga the CEO of Kahunganu Fano Services in Wellington. Tēnā koe. Tēnā koe, Shane. Ellie, thank you for joining us this morning. Tell us, what are you seeing on the ground? What are you seeing and hearing? You're right at the coalface working with Fano. How is COVID-19 impacting the whānau that you're work working with? Well, I think what COVID-19 has done is uncovered more vulnerability um, that is present in our communities. It's, it's exposed more poverty, it's exposed more homelessness. And there are some serious issues in our community um, that have been further highlighted through um, COVID-19. It strikes me uh, because we have these conversations and we've been having a number of these in recent weeks. And without a doubt, the, the, there has been strong government support uh, to tackle some of the issues that you mention. But as you have said, these issues have been long standing. They're not new issues. If anything, things have just become worse. Is, is that your take on this? Yes, I think um, what will occur now in our communities is that it will escalate, especially with the economic impact um, that we're about to experience. Because as we know, Māori are less likely to experience uh, good experiences. Um, and we're challenged um, by those aspects of everyday living as well. Um, the, the gap are being exposed more and we are working really hard to, um, to support our whānau without making them needy because they have some real strengths and we have to create the space for them to be able to apply their strengths and respond as because they are resilient as well. I'm glad you mentioned that because we tend to focus more on uh, vulnerability than strength. And so can you share with us some of the stories that you have experienced or seen over the last few weeks that demonstrate Fano resilience? Yeah, sure. Uh, we have instances where we have um, moved to support Fano out of tents and put them into emergency housing. But by providing good wraparound service, we're able to hear their stories and understand exactly what their strengths are so that they can themselves start to progress as a whānau. Um, there have been a number of occasions where this has come to the forefront and just by giving them the space to do that, we have been delivering a number of food parcels and right now by giving them the space to um, understand how they, their um, disposable incomes can be used um, in a more viable way, um, we now have 
had a case of two of our whānau who have come back to us this week and said, we no longer need that food parcel. This is what we're going to do going forward. And that's a success. It might seem minimal to some of us, but that's a huge success for a whānau, especially someone who's been living in a tent for who knows how long. Absolutely, that is significant. Talk to us about the work that you're doing to support whānau transition from emergency housing and into uh, more permanent housing or transitional housing. Okay, so often what we have to do first is to understand their readiness. So right now, uh, while they're in emergency housing, we're working with them um, through the use of Zoom, through the use of phone contact, and also through the use of safe physical distancing. Um, our kai parcels are that uh, tool that we use to express manaakitanga and hear their story, and so we still have the conversations. We have been able to provide them with the information that um, and understanding of what our government is putting out, and there is a lot of information being able to unpack that for them so that they can understand what that actually means in its true sense and really what it means for them as a whānau. Um, we are also providing support around uh, managing relationships. Um, so we have a team of counsellors, social workers and people with lived experience that they are able to contact 24-7, seven days a week and just at any time where they are feeling vulnerable to uh, perhaps engaging in behaviour that isn't necessarily positive, but also highlighting um, that they have something to contribute to the current situation. The next question is a question that I've been asking a number of those working in your space. And that is, if the government is listening this morning to this conversation, what more do you need from the government to help you do your job and to meet the need that exists within our communities? I think right now I must acknowledge the work of, um, of many of the government departments that we have been working with, especially um, within the Ministry of Housing and Urban Development and of course our Te Kahui Kainga Order uh, within the Ministry of Housing and Urban Development. I think the message is let's not let the pandemic um, create opportunity all the time because the opportunities that have come to us are so positive but at a time where um, you know these, these uh, relationships and opportunities should have been available before a pandemic is you know, what we're working with today. I, they need to continue. I think a tangata whenua response is required. We need to be at the table and we can't be, uh, Māori providers cannot be the next option. Um, as we all know, those more likely to experience uh, uh, negative responses are Māori. The, the uh, statistics tell us that. But also in saying that, we also have the answers. So we might be part of the um, highlight of the statistics, but we have the answers. We have the uh, resilience. We have uh, our uh, tikanga that supports us, and we can evolve in these situations because Māori are agile, and we are ready for it. Ali hamlin Paying it. thank you so much for joining us this morning. I've really appreciated you highlighting the areas uh, of vulnerability, but more importantly, stressing and emphasising the areas of strength and resilience uh, within our whānau. Nō reira, kā nui te mihi kia Kia ora, Shane. Ali hamlin Paying there, the CEO of Kahungunu Whānau Services in Wellington. Well, 42,000 children returned to partially reopened schools and early learning services today. Under Alert Level 3, children up to Year 10 whose parents can't work from home are allowed to return to class, as are those who can't study from home. Dr Melanie Riwai Couch has conducted an online survey to gauge the positives and the negatives in the first week of learning at home. What she found, she says, could help reframe the, what drives the current curriculum and how it's delivered. Melanie joins us now. Tēnā koe, Melanie. Tell us about the survey. Why did you do it and uh, what have you found? Um, the survey actually started with a bit of a wondering about mm. how things were working for parents, uh, mostly because um, not only do I work in education and, and have worked with schools, 
Um, I also have five of my own children, and so I was hearing a lot of uh, things about experiences. So I wanted to do a survey just so that we could actually try and capture what Fano, what parents were experiencing now in such a unique time. Um, so with my work with Evaluation Associates, we were able to gather those voices and produce the report. So tell us about what those voices have told you. Well, firstly, I really want to acknowledge the voices that were shared and thank the parents who responded to the survey and entrusting us um, with their words. Their perspectives are really valuable. Some of the overarching um, benefits, I guess, that have come from this period that's a little bit different, um, and maybe actually I'll just read you a quote from one parent. They said, spending more time with our children and getting more familiar with their style of learning, what their challenges are and what they excel at. And parents are experiencing their children through a slightly different lens. Um, there was a lot of gratitude um, from parents for the efforts schools were making to communicate with them and to provide them with resources. Um, and I guess the flip side of that too is they offered some really constructive suggestions about how it could be better for them. How could it be better for them? What were some of the constructive uh, suggestions made? Um, there were a few tensions because I guess... A, some parents are asking for greater clarity, uh, more understanding about, you know, what they can do to support their children. But the flip side to that is we also have matua who are saying, hey, we really enjoy the freedom to decide what our tamariki are learning. It, um, it's a feeling of freedom to be able to explore learning in a more empowering way. So there are some of those tensions that exist there. Um, Access to resources, obviously, in that first week when people were in schools were still working out processes, so there was a lot of unknowing and anxiety. Um, and I guess one of the things that, that Fano or parents struggled with was how they could provide um, those peer relationships for their children, um, the social interaction and things like that that they would usually get when they were physically at school. Were you surprised as a long-time educator by what you discovered? And, 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 and I suppose specifically, what really stood out for you? Sure. I don't, I don't know that it, it surprised me, but something that I found really affirming from the voices that came through was just this overwhelming desire of parents to want their children to be successful in education and um, the real impression that they wanted to be part of that conversation. And I think homeschool partnerships are valuable not just in a time of crisis, they're valuable all the time. And so we really hope that um, by capturing the voices now, as schools work out um, down the track what things are going to look like for them, that there is a space for parent voice to be determining contributors to what's going to be happening for their kids. Mm. In your opinion, are whānau Māori being supported enough in the education that happens in the home? It was really interesting. In the... Um, in the data from the report, we asked for an indicator of overall happiness. So they had a five-star rating. And nearly half of all parents um, rated the experience of four or five, which is, which is really great. I guess the concern is that nearly a quarter of the parents also rated it a one or a two. So there's always going to be a range of experiences, and that's why it's so critically important that schools are in tune um, with their individual families and parents. The other thing to note is that, you know, this this is a snapshot of a group of parents who responded at a particular time. And while it tells us a lot of things, um, it's, it's not the answers to everything. We deliberately haven't made recommendations, but we've posed questions um, so that as schools consider what school-led learning at home looks like or as, as learning returns back to schools, what it might look like, that we remember to consider the perspectives of our, of our Māori parents. What kind of opportunity exists now, do you think, to think differently about curriculum and the relationship between uh, schools and whānau going forward? I think there's an absolutely great opportunity. Um, I think it would be really... Um, I think we'd be doing a disservice if school returned just to the status quo. I think there's an opportunity out of this disruption to see what's actually working well for whānau, what's working well for our Māori students. We also included um, a group of Pacifica parents as well who should be mentioned. But we need to take all of those positives and think about when school goes back, 
What is it that we can take from that? What can we learn? And schools are in a, in a constant state of reflection and inquiry into their practice. And so I, I really hope that that becomes part of that. And that cont those conversations will take place at a school level. Will you be sharing your research, if, if you haven't already, with the Ministry of Education and with others? Um, it has been shared with the Ministry of Education and they are very interested in what it says and um, we'll be having some conversations. Melanie, thank you so much uh, for the work that you've done with the survey and for joining us this morning. Tēnā rā koe. Well, moving on from education to the kitchen. Rocky Road fermented Fijoa juice, venison stew with mashed potatoes, chicken burgers and chicken veggie pasta, relish, homemade LCM, so I'm not sure what those are, but anyhow, uh, homemade Big Macs and Chinese takeaways. Not the menu of a five-star restaurant, but the kai that's been cooked in the Te Ako home in Kirikiriroa. For Hamilton, father of two, J of two Jason Te Ako, being on lockdown didn't mean his whanau's diet and nutrition needs would suffer. Jason joins us now. Tēnā koe, Jason. Kia ora. Atamari. Atamari. So how have you and your whānau been doing during lockdown? Yeah, I think um, it's been great. Whānau have been eating well and living well. and Yeah, definitely been a um, good bonding time. Bonding and a lot of cooking, I understand. You've turned your kitchen into a five-star restaurant. Yeah, something like that. Um, just trying to utilise um, time off, I suppose, and get creative with the kids and keep them busy. Yeah, so it's been yeah, really good. Have you always been passionate about cooking? Um, yep, I, I think all Māoris like um, their kai, but uh, yep, from a young age I've been um, yeah, inspired by some good whānau, whānau members that have helped me along the way uh, with my cooking and that. And yeah, from when I was at primary, really, uh, my my mum would sort of uh, there would always be leftovers in the fridge, and my my older brother he would eat all the jam and peanut butter sandwiches and that. So my first sort of hit at it was. Um, chucking cheese on top of the leftover veggies and I suppose then it was just using the microwave and melting cheese, but hey, now I can make a cheese sauce. So, yeah. <laughs> I think we've all got uh, stories to, to share um, around using leftovers, right? Your mum, uh, you mentioned, ha was a big influence on you to be a cook, right? Yes. No, definitely she um, inspired, well, really my mum and my, my older brother and sister, we all can sort of we all dabble with the cooking, my brother more so with the baking, which is not my sort of forte. Uh, my cakes always generally turn out to be puddings, but add a bit of cream and, yeah, no worries. But no, Mum definitely has. She would always have our kai on the table in the morning, early hours of the morning. Uh, in the morning, she'd make our breakfast and, um, yeah, she'd always have dinner on at five o'clock and pot of tea. So now, yeah, she was a great inspiration. You've been working alongside your tamariki to come up with the meals you make. What do you think is the value for them in doing that? Um, well, my kids aren't fussy. They love their vegetables. I think uh, for them it's just inclusion, keeping them um, included in what they're going to be making for the day. Um, yeah, uh, I think it's just learning new skills for them. Um, and just probably just teaching them some easy meals that they can make themselves. So yeah, it's I think it's important that they know where the kai comes from, from the from the mara and yeah. We were just talking in the interview before this one, the the, the previous interview about uh, learning at home, and it strikes me that this is a, a very good example of tamariki learning at home with uh, their parents and real practical but meaningful ways? Yes, definitely. I think it, definitely um, it's been good for my kids because it's also sort of filled those quiet times with stuff for us to do together. I mean, we go out and do a bit of bike riding during the day just to get our vitamin D, but, yeah, learning those skills at home with the kids um, and just um, conversing with them and all the little funny things they say during the day whilst we're cooking. 
So we've seen some of your successes uh, in the kitchen. Uh, were there any failures that you can share with us? Uh, many failures, but uh, I suppose my biggest one was one Christmas is uh, we had a hangi steamer and I suppose I went to go and smoke the meat to give it a nice smoky flavour as you do and I kind of smoked it too long and yeah, it was just really strong through the kai, so that was my biggest failure I would say. <laughs> I know you've uh, recreated some of the kai your whanau have missed uh, buying during lockdown such as Big Macs, uh, but what else inspires you in your cooking? Um, yeah, I, th I think it goes back to my um, my mum, my brothers and sisters. They've um, sort of paved the way for my learning and my my cooking these days. Uh, a lot of my aunties would do a lot of would do a lot of cooking when we turned up. They'd just go in the kitchen and whip up a a scone mix, and they were never short of having a kai on the table for us. So whether it was a bread and jam, there was always something that they put on the table for us. So those kind of people have always been my role models, really. I have to ask, uh, Jason, uh, were you craving for takeaways yesterday? Have you been to your local uh, takeout joint uh, in the last 24 hours? No, I haven't, actually, to tell you the truth. And uh, the other day, my son said to me that, oh, Dad, I've kind of gone off the takeaways, which is a bonus for me. They a bit more uh, putia in the back pocket. So, yeah, everything helps. That's a good result for me. That's a beautiful result, uh, I'm sure, Jason. Jason, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Uh, it sounds like you're a great dad, and um, yeah, it, it, it's just really cool to um, learn and understand the magic that we've seen in some of our homes over the last few weeks, and the, it certainly looks like there's been a lot of magic in yours. So thank you for joining us this morning. Kia ora no, Shane, thank you. Jason Tiako there from Hamilton. Well, from Hamilton to Kaitaia, couple Connie and Tony Hassan love to sing their stay safe message to their online audience. The couple in their 60s are lockdown entertainment regulars who use waiata to remind people to stick to the rules and look out for each other. I spoke to Connie and Tony earlier today. Connie and Tony, tēnā kōrua. Thank you for joining the programme this morning. Thank you for having You're us. You're welcome. welcome. Tēnā koe. Tell us, how has lockdown been for you both? I think it's been a wonderful experience and I think a lot of people have learned a lot from it and I believe that a lot of strength has been gained from it as well. We've, we've appreciated spending the time together and with our whānau, our mokos, and uh, yeah, it's a, been a great time. You mentioned, Connie, that this has been a, a learning experience for you and for others. What, what, what is something that you've learnt over the last few weeks? I've learnt that, uh, you know, when you look at history and I think about my parents and how we were brought up on the effect of the A-Agent flu, and then I think of all the strength we learnt from that, um, from the 1918s. And so people have reached out and I think there's been this collective strengthening. So that's what I've learned is that we can reach out, mm. that we can afi and totoko each other and that's a real growing and I think it's going to continue to grow and strengthen and that's been a great learning experience. Thank you for sharing Thank that. For that sharing is that. Uh, wonderful to hear. Now you're both uh, musicians in your own right. Uh, of course you've got instruments with you now. Let's talk about your singing and the music that you've been making over the past few weeks. You sing the old hits, but with your own words. What is your message through song? I think we wanted to really reiterate the stay safe message in a positive way. We wanted to uh, really reiterate every day the importance of staying safe, mm. offing each other and reaching out. And the whole thing was about, you know, keeping all the rules around it, the masks, the, the gloves, the distancing, all that. But above all, it's about loving each other. How have you been able to help some of your audience? Well, we've had uh, phone calls and text messages asking us to contact them. They've wanted a listening ear or where they could go for help. Um, I think particularly people who have been on their own. Uh, bubbled down by themselves, but also the fact that so many people have said that the karakia that we start with in the morning, the pre-song, 
has been something that they've held on to every day. So mm. for us, if that's if we touch one person, we don't profess to be singers, Shane. <laughs> We've never professed to be singers. But if we can use what little gift we have to Afi and, and Totoko people, then it's a gift. Well, thank you for that. How long have you been singing together and where, where do you normally sing? We, uh, we've been married for 38 years. We've been singing together for about 39. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we, these days we usually sing together in our church. Wonderful. Well, tell us about the song that you're going to sing for us today. Well, this is one... Um, you, you remember the, the song Never on a Sunday if, if you're older old enough <laughs> and this is based around that really but it's really one which um, which is saying reach out to, if you need help reach out you now reach out to your whanau your friends and um, but stay safe stay in your bubble um, yeah it's just updating the lyrics a li little bit um, yeah well we can't wait to hear it Tony Connie and Tony the time is all yours Thank you, Shane. What a shame. Oh, we're still locked down all on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday because we're so very good. We will stay here on Thursday and Friday and Saturday because we know we should. We'll do it all again on Sunday, on Sunday, on Sunday, because Sunday is the best. Cause we are fighting Corona, Corona, Corona And now we need a reason If we stay strong in COVID-19 Then it won't be long We'll be stage three So we'll stay bubble bound for our loved ones say, as keen as we know, we've got what it takes. Or you can text me on a cool day, a hot day, a wet day, whichever one you choose. Or ring my cell phone on a gray day, a May day, a pay day, you know I want with you. And you can eat me on a break day, a break day, a week day, you know I will reply. And even call me on a Sunday, a Sunday, a Sunday, since we can't drop off. If we stay strong and COVID-19 free, then it won't be long. We will be stage three, so we'll stay bubble bound for our loved ones' sake. As Kiwis, we know we've got what it takes. Connie and Tony, thank you so much for making our day with that magical number and thank you also for sharing this magic across the country and to the world. Nga mihi nui kia kōrua. What a cute couple. Coming up on Tapatahi tomorrow, public health advocate Dr Ilana Curtis warns Māori deaths could rise due to gaps in health care for chronic conditions during the COVID-19 crisis. And we look ahead to what the future might hold for the Māori authorities, which manage $11.5 billion in assets. We hear from Federation of Māori Authorities Chairperson Tracy Haupapa. Well, thank you to all our guests today and thank you for joining us. See you tomorrow, same time, same place. Koi nā a tapatahi mo tēnei rā, kia piki te ora te kaha, me te mārama tanga kia koutou katoa, hei ko nā mo tēnei wā. Mm -hmm.